Hello everyone. This is the CPT broad stroke section and I'm going to attempt to do this video in one cut just like real life. And when I was doing the test video earlier, I noticed how difficult it was just to speak to a camera instead of a person. And so I'm really lucky to be able to introduce Marsha Lee, who is a great friend from Detroit, where we had our 2015 Peacemaker Congress. And so Marsha is standing right beside the camera to make it possible for me to share this with you um, with as much uh, connection as possible. I wish I could be with you in person or by Skype and I do believe I'll have a chance to check in and say hello later. Right now I'm connecting with some new constituencies in Brazil and connecting them with our ongoing project work of Christian Peacemaker teams as well as supporting the gutsy and important peacemaking work happening there right now in that post-Olympic and post-coup space. So I ask for your thoughts and prayers as CPT uh, continues all over the world to build partnerships that transform violence and oppression. So. Here we go. First, of course, just want to bless our time together. Bismillah um, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. May this be giving glory um, to God, most gracious, most merciful. And I look forward to any questions that you have and of course, I have full confidence and trust in those who are there with you in running the training to be able to share with you their experience of Christian Peacemaker teams and to be able to um, nuance and give stories about the broad strokes that I'm going to share. Sometimes it's hard to know where the story of Christian Peacemaker Team starts. The idea that we can make a difference and have an impact on our world is an ancient one. So CPT is drawing on the energy of really ancient thoughts and work that people do within their societies towards wholeness, towards justice, towards health for not only themselves and their family, but also for their neighbors and even widening their circle of care for those who maybe others call enemies or they call enemies. That impulse towards a sense that we're no longer at a moment where it's us versus them, but it's all of us or none, is the moment in which we find ourselves. And so Christian Peacemaker Teams is, is an organization that's committed to building partnerships to transform the violence and oppression in the world because this is a moment in which like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said either we figure out how to live together as people on this planet or we all die together as fools. CPT began with a challenge a challenge, in this case, to pacifist Christians who were finding themselves becoming more and more comfortable within the space of U.S. imperialism, 
Canadian expansionism, and other countries in the world as well. So, the challenge began. What if you all, as pacifist Christians, take seriously the challenge to live out your faith and call to peacemaking that you insist is the center of the gospel? What would that look like? What would it look like if you trained as hard for that peace you believe in and want to see as militaries train for war? What could happen? And what could happen if you were willing to give of your lives? Give everything for that cause of peace. Give everything like, like we expect soldiers to give for the cause of war. And I would add, what would happen if we as a global community or just those of us who believe that a healthy and whole way of living on this planet is possible, what if we dedicated as many resources towards nonviolent experiments as we dedicate towards violent and destructive experiments? What could happen? So Christian Peacemaker Teams is an experiment in answering some of those questions. The person who put out this challenge was named Ron Sider, and the, the date was 1984, and the location was Strasbourg, France, at a gathering of, of pacifists, um, a global gathering. Two years later, people who were at that gathering and, and some who weren't heard this challenge and wanted to act on it. They knew they didn't have everything they needed, but they had enough to begin and to try. And with that foundational commitment to nonviolence, they were able to give themselves a permission to start something, even though they didn't know everything, because nonviolence is a commitment to not eliminating the other. Nonviolence is a commitment that says there's nothing and no one that we can't learn something from. Nonviolence helps us to be able to be bold, passionate, annoying even, because we remain in conversation with all other parties in any given conflict, be that on a personal level, between teammates or in families, to the political level. Now, nonviolence doesn't mean that we're neutral. In fact, those who began CPT didn't want to introduce a, a neutral peacemaking body. We wanted to introduce a question of what happens when you come in and you identify what's happening with power. You recognize that you carry a certain type of power personally, and depending on the social structure in which you live, you carry more or less power in those contexts. And with the power you have, you examine the powers that be in a situation, and you unapologetically work towards helping to equalize those powers. An illustration from Desmond Tutu, he says, you know, when a mouse and an elephant are fighting, and you enter the situation, and you see that the elephant has his foot on the mouse's tail. And you say in that situation, hey, I'm here to observe. I'm neutral. The mouse is not going to be very happy. You can't have negotiations between a mouse and an elephant when the elephant is actively pressing down on part of the mouse's body. So we don't go in to places um, like, like Palestine and Israel and just say, hey, how can we get everyone to work together? Rather, we go where we're invited and we work on getting that elephant's foot off of the mouse's tail. That way, the mouse has more breathing room and we can think together 
taking direction from those who are most marginalized in the situation, taking their direction about what it would mean to create space for peace and to have the chance to be able to equalize those power dynamics. When you have equal power dynamics, you can do more negotiation. But in all the places where CPT works, our peacemaking work happens at a moment of confrontation. A moment in which conflicts are overt, in which power dynamics are not equal, and in which there is a chance to move from a situation which is static to a situation that is dynamic. And that involves a lot of rupture. It involves a lot of change. It involves leadership from grassroots communities. And so Christian Peacemaker Teams goes where it's invited, alongside grassroots communities that are taking the lead in creating a world in which power dynamics are not static, but power is flowing among all in the ecosystem. We work with communities that do not shy away from naming the conflicts that are at hand. And we look at the structures of the situation. I'm going to call structural violence oppression. We, looked at, we look at oppression happening within the situation so that we can examine the ways in which the power that we have interacts with the power that's on the ground, the dynamics there, and we can identify how structural oppression contributes to the violence and creates more violence. When the idea of CPT began, From Ron Sider, there was a desire to have big teams and, and, and many people ready to, to like die for the cause of peace. Um, and while that's a valiant vision, what we learned pretty quickly in the discussions and setting up CPT is that um, hundreds of thousands of, of peacemakers anywhere, particularly if they were um, from a dominant global north space, would be really overwhelming to local communities on the ground anywhere. And so we pr pretty quickly made a switch from the ideas of large groups of people going somewhere to be more in small teams. Small teams of people who could truly listen to local voices. Small teams that could reflect together, that could worship together or in some way build community through spirituality to nurture the recognition that peacemaking work is not just an in and out thing, but a long haul struggle. And the importance of being invited to go wherever we are. CPTers come from about 16 different countries now. The administrative team lives in about three or four different countries. And when people ask me where the headquarters of CPT are, I point to our field teams who have a lot of autonomy and who are leading us as an organization in terms of what we need to know to develop some of the best strategic nonviolent intervention in areas of war and lethal conflict and structural oppression. So I consider our headquarters to be in Sudimani, Iraqi Kurdistan, to be in Hebron al Khalil, Palestine, to be in Turtle Island, Winnipeg, to be in Barranca Bermeja in Colombia. And yes, we do a lot of um, coordination, communications coordination from where administrative team members are and from the Chicago office, but leadership happens all across the CPT.
Just a few images. Some of you may know Gene Stolzfus. He was one of the people present in 1986 at the meetings that began Christian Peacemaker Teams and was the first director for many years. Thanks, Gene. Gene Stolzfus's vision included a recognition early on, as I said before, about, about the fact that it's all of us or none. And so CPT had a seed in it of being deeply inclusive. Being inclusive before it was cool to be inclusive. This is the late 80s we're talking about. So, very early on, being an organization of faith, we were unapologetically welcoming to people of all gender and sexual orientations. This is really important because though many denominations have opened up their doors, often folks who are queer are not invited to represent the faith in any particular way or to be allowed to be visible and out on the front lines. In CPT, we definitely are. People also from different racial and cultural backgrounds. It's not about tolerating diversity, it's about recognizing that people who are marginalized in society because of race, gender, ethnicity, orientation, religion, class, anything, bring really valuable insights to peacemaking and how to create a global family that makes space for all of us. So that inclusive vision is still with CPT today. This also means that we're not an evangelical organization in the sense of proselytization. We respect how the divine is leading everyone. We recognize that in order to do this work over the long haul, it's going to draw from the values and the beliefs that we all hold deepest. So we also respect each and every person's path to the, to the divine, while also not trying to reduce all of our different faiths to a least common denominator. We recognize that there are conflicts in conceptual frameworks between faith communities. We don't deny that. In fact, sometimes, most of the time, if it's handled well, conflict can make us stronger. I'm talking about nonviolent -con non conflict. And I'm talking about conflict as a generative force. Conflict is like the friction between ideas. Like when the rubber of your bike tire goes on the ground, if it's icy and there's no friction, you can like slip and get hurt. But it's the road itself touching the tire that really enables things to go forward. And conflict can be like that friction. If we keep conflict up to date, if we recognize how being in places with external conflict influences how conflict shows up in our team life and in ourselves, then we have a chance at peace. A nonviolent world will have more conflict than a violent one. Because again, nonviolence means you can't eliminate the other who you're in a disagreement with. You refuse to take them out of the picture, physically or verbally. And instead, you have to dig in deep to find that nonviolent enemy love, to find that commitment to keep going and figure out how we share this planet with people of different and similar truth claims. And we're in this, we're in this now. We're in this together now. As I said, it was the late 80s when CPT was formed. 
and some of the influences on our organization come from that time period and that moment. There was a lot of organizing across the global south at that time for deep freedom of all types. And CPT was especially formed in the crucible of the consciousness raising movements of Latin America and the sanctuary movements within the global north that recognized the impact of economic and military policies on Latin America and how this was forcing some of the first waves of major immigration into the United States and Canada. For this reason, many CPTers are Spanish English bilingual, for example, because many of them came from movements that had learned a lot from solidarity with Latin America. Now also we have CPTers that are bilingual in Kurdish and in Arabic and um, in Indonesian in the case of the regional group in Australia and Oceania and many other languages comprise the CPT family. One thing that people observed during that time was about nonprofit organizations in Latin America that could give relief and could help at development work, but were not willing to go all the way with some of the things the villagers suggested, such as doing nonviolent direct action, such as politically speaking out in a non neutral way, standing for campesinos, that is, peasant farmers who don't have as much of a voice in the political situation. Standing alongside indigenous peoples who are being threatened with genocide and violence. So Christian peacemaker teams differentiated from many of the non-governmental organization NGOs at that time because it was willing to be with the community through thick and thin. If the community was challenging a local law, CPTers would and could too. Through the leadership of the community, our relationships have changed over time. And so the, the things that we do in each location where we are, are different and correspond to what communities feel are the most strategic action in that place. We worked in Chiapas in Mexico, Washington, D.C. in the United States, Vieques off the coast of Puerto Rico, Haiti, We've worked um, in a number of locations with short-term teams. And as we um, came, came and kept growing as an organization, responding to our partners also began to recognize that a longer-term set of relationships made more sense for the type of work that needed to be done in order to sustain this peacemaking work that the communities were doing. So, a lot of our um, projects that we have now began in the early 2000s and the one in Hebron al-Khalil began in 1995. You'll get more information about each project and the longevity of it um, during all of the project briefings, so I won't go into that now. But that isn't to say that CPT will necessarily be in any one place forever. We recognize that people were resisting before we came and will resist after we're gone. In fact, CPT as an organization itself, as an expression of an experiment in building partnerships, in addressing power, CPT itself, if it ceases to exist, we know that all the energy that's within it will go into this broader movement for social justice. We are giving of our lives as an organization to this deeper, broader cause. Movements of people willing to take action for peace, willing to be bold and unapologetic about it being all of us or none at this time in the world. I'm really grateful to each of you uh, who have come to this training. 
to, for, I'm grateful for your life path that has brought you here and for what you'll do in the future. Now might be a good time to take a little break and then we'll continue in a moment. Thanks.